Cool. All right. Um, hello, Matoko Bootcamp. Uh, my name is Kyle Peacock. I am a uh, Definity team member. I'm a senior software engineer on the SDK team. Um, at Definity, I basically own the AgentJS uh, JavaScript agent, so the library that you use to talk to applications on the internet computer. Um, I also dabble in a fair bit of Matoko programming, uh, producing libraries, uh, and just kind of focusing on developer experience in general. Um, so you can see some of the educational materials I've put out, such as the Coding with Kyle uh, video series, which takes you through a uh, building a full application uh, with live coding. We'll be doing basically that kind of format in the video that we're about to present. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy uh, teaching and knowledge sharing. Um, so you can find me in the, uh, developer discord, what is it called now? The internet computer devs, or is it still, yeah, the IC developer community discord, uh, as well as the forums. Do I work on the front end for internet identity? Uh, I was part of the original team that built internet identity, uh, but I haven't been actively working on it in a while. Um, so I was there for kind of the initial scramble to get it out the door, but now I just own the uh, off client library that lets you talk to it, and we have other folks who are building the uh, the current application. Cool. So with that, um, this topic is going to be on access control, which is basically just a way of saying um, when you're building an application, who has permissions to view or make changes to certain um, information that's stored on your canister. So the application that I've coded here is basically like, it's a counter where you basically say, each principal can only make changes to their own counter. And then there's like a little front end that lets you make those calls and also displays uh, the counts. Uh, very straightforward, but... Um, it gives you a good example of both how to set up a front-end application. Uh, so I've got like vite.js um, as a bundler set up in, in the repo. I've got some stuff on identity, uh, some very basics, and then uh, a Matoko application that knows how to work with that. So feel free to shoot Q&A questions throughout. I'll do my best to answer, uh, but let's go ahead and play the video. Let's go. Hello, Matoko Bootcamp. I'm Kyle Peacock, a senior software engineer from the SDK team at the Definity Foundation. And today I'll be presenting to you uh, an introduction to Matoko, as well as a guide on how to do access control for your canister and connecting that with front-end authentication. We'll be using two strategies. One is using a secret, uh, just typed into an input, and the other will be to use internet identity to log in using the II login button web component. This tutorial is going to walk through uh, a very cursory overview review to getting started with Matoko development. And we'll also show how to add access controls to have resources in Matoko that are controlled by a specific user in the front end. For these purposes, we're going to get started by using the MOPS package manager, as well as DFX. And for the front end, uh, which we'll get to in a bit, we're going to use Vite and the JavaScript agent for managing that information. So you should have Node.js, DFX, and MOPS installed for this. Links to those will be made available in the repository. To get started, though, let's go ahead and set up 
mops. For this, we're going to add two packages, which are map and JSON. Uh, and JSON is going to be uh, provided as a GitHub URL. You can use named packages or a direct link to the GitHub. And I'm running mops install to bring that package in. Now I'll go ahead and set up the dfx.json. I'll set up the front end with some basic information here. And I'll go ahead and paste in a snippet that will install internet identity using Canton and Wasm from the latest release. For our canister smart contract, uh, we will use these custom packages uh, that we imported a bit ago. And we can set up our actor here. And we can go ahead and set up our actor here. We can go ahead and initialize uh, a map. This application is going to store a list or a, a map of principles to counts. So the front end is just going to have you click on an, a website, click a button, increase your count. And the back end canister is going to control those. So you need to have this the certain identity in order to update it. Um, but yeah, it'll be a pretty straightforward increment and then reveal information about that. So let's go ahead and then set up our map using a principal hash provided by the map. Uh, now we can have our increment method. This will be a public function, so it can be called by anything. And by using shared caller, we can know who is calling the method. Here we can name it. We don't need any arguments to pass, which we would put inside of here. Uh, and then we need to define what is returned. So in public methods, it always is going to be an async response. Uh, and this will just be a nat number uh, of the count. Here we can assign prev to the output of a switch based on the option that is returned by math.get. In the null case, uh, we'll just say if there doesn't exist a previous value, then it's zero. And if there is a number, then we'll return the number. So that's what the previous number is. Then the next value is previous plus one. And then we need to pass in all of the signatures here for what to set. And finally, return next. So revisiting, we fetch the value, uh, which is based off of the get response, which returns an option uh, out of our counts map. Uh, we figure out what the next value is. We set we update the value, and then we return the final value. Next, we can do a really simple get the count of the caller. Once again, no arguments required. And returning a number. This will just allow the caller to check what their own count is at any point. And we can just reuse this logic here. 
and return it immediately. Uh, you don't need to, you can optionally, if you prefer, uh, use the return keyword here. Um, but otherwise, if it's not assigned to anything, the output in Matoka will automatically get returned. So that's why you could see return next or simply leaving on its own. Those are going to be functionally the same. Um, and now we have a slightly more complicated, oh, and that's right. This is um, a, there's no change that needs to happen here. So in order to make this faster, we can also say public shared query function. Um, and by tagging it as a query, that means that we can get a fast response back. So be sure to do that if there's no uh, side effects that your methods need to have. And so now we can go ahead and create our get counts method, where we're going to use the JSON package that we imported before to return a, a JSON response of uh, a list of all of the principles and their counts that are stored in the map. So here we can get all of the entries out of our map. And we need to insert them into a buffer. Uh, the type here is going to be a JSON entry. So JSON, the package, and then the JSON type, uh, starting from an empty array. I'm going to import the buffer here. Uh, command period pulls up the quick fix menu here. Uh, because the response type needs to be returned, let's just go ahead and say uh, our return type here will be put by json.show, which will be an array variant of the buffer two array entries. Uh, now to actually insert the entries, we're going to iterate through all of the map entries by destructuring the tuple here. Because the entries returns a tuple of the key and the value. So we can iterate through them like this and get access to these named values each time we iterate. Um, so we can just simply say entries uh, first a tuple of the key that we're going to use in the JSON response. and then the value. And we need to do the same thing for count. And that's all we need to do. So to revisit, uh, we can use this stable map, which will persist across updates we can increment the count inside of the map. We can uh, check our own count and we can get all of the counts as a JSON response. Let's move on to the front end. First, we'll set up NPM. Uh, with NPM init dash Y. I'm gonna go ahead and install uh, a few of the agent JS packages. Uh, so that's the Divinity agent, Candid, the principal. I'll also go ahead and install Divinity slash identity and Divinity slash II login button. We'll be using both of these in the front end. For the bundler, we're going to use Vite. So I'm going to create vite.config 
index.js. I'm just going to paste in an existing byte config. Uh, which is going to install uh, Vite. It has some pretty basics. It's going to point to the front end directory, specify where to go out to. It also sets up a proxy to the uh, localhost 4943 port, which is where DFX is going to be running, so it can talk to the canister. And it also has an environment plugin, which is going to allow it to um, handle the declarations that we're going to generate uh, for talking to our canister. Also go ahead and add in these dependencies here. And I'm going to also copy in some scripts. Yeah. You wanted to... Uh, cool, yeah. We've got a few questions. And since it's moving on from the Motoko portion to the front end, I feel like talking about okay. some of what people are asking is a good idea now. You want me want me to go back like here? Um yeah, just with that open probably. Um so for one thing, people were asking about the use of variants in the Motoko library. Um yeah, I think it's here. Right. Right. So it makes sense. This is some kind of more complicated um, Motoko here. Um, so this library, because you can see the um, uh, the JSON dot show method, right? I can. I can also. Um, uh, I can also go directly to the code, so you can. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's here and here and uh, here. Uh, if I can guess here. Yeah. And probably bump it up a couple of sizes. Yeah. Like this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, down at the bottom of get accounts. Um, in order to do a JSON text response, which is nice to parse in JavaScript, um, or just for whatever kind of API you want to structure, uh, at the bottom on line 40, we have json.show. And because that is a single method and it needs to just be able to handle a JSON type, the, um, the json.json which we defined on line 30, um, the json.json, that type is basically a series of variants. Uh, you can have a JSON object, a JSON array, a JSON string. Uh, those are all like, there's a few others, but those are all the like valid types that JSON can have. And by defining like an object, an object can be an object of keys and JSON values. Um, so it's kind of this recursive type. Um, but the result of it is you need to tag uh, the variance so that it is able to then figure out uh, what the things that you're going to pass it are. Um, so in this case, an array, we tell it, OK, so if we take this buffer and we spit it out to an array, it will be an array of what have to be JSON types. Um, and yeah, so what that ends up looking like, we've got an object where I say we've got a key of principal and a value of a string, as well as a key of count and a value of string. Um, and Vlad asks why object and not array? Uh, that's really just kind of random preference. Uh, this could all be a single object with a key of principal and an array or a value of count. Um, but I just felt like an array was a nice type to work with in the front end. Yeah, I, I just want to say, uh, like, the variants mainly come from this library that we imported. And this library is something that we can find, that we can find here. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, mainly coming from this, right? 
yeah, this is how the type yeah. JSON is defined here. Um, and so, yeah. Yep, so that's where the object and array stuff comes from. Uh, we've also got a question from, uh, let's start at the top here. Um, I think I've answered the why is it a variant, but um, Modrizar asks, hash map is not stable, but map is. Uh, yes, this is a stable map that I've imported. Uh, hash map is not stable, but this map library is. Um, so that's pretty convenient. Um, and that's why I recommend using it. Uh, it's a good go-to. Uh, Yosefa asks, why is let p hash equal map? Uh, yeah, that is the uh, struct or destructuring <laughs> rather than destruction. Uh, but yeah, so because we import the map module, uh, I can then say let p hash equal map, and then we can reference the p hash out of the map module uh, and use that uh, as the principal hash function. Uh, it also provides a bunch more of those hashes, but since the key that we're using here is a principle, the, the p hash is what we needed to use for most of these calls. Um, cool. And so then uh, uh, Shada asks, I wonder what happens when a public shared function defined within an actor class generates a syntax error on public. Um, it's probably around like the order of the keywords that you have. Uh, it, it's pretty picky about public, shared, query, caller, func, like it, it all has to be in that particular order. Um, an example of using auth, using the caller with hash map or maybe another map. Um, if we've got time at the end, I could show a couple other ways that you can use uh, principles as keys. Uh, uh, in my IC avatar example, uh, which is up on my GitHub, um, I've got one with a try um, data structure. That's another stable uh, data structure. Uh, and I'm using principles as keys there. Um, but yeah, we can get into that a little bit later. Is it the, the playlist? Okay, no, it's not this one. Sorry. I wanted to show, like to send them a link to the avatar series. Yeah, I, I can pull that up as well. Let's go. Yeah, let's Wait. go ahead. I think we've answered everything. Ah, I just see one last question. Uh, someone asked, map is stable because you explicitly use stable. Otherwise, it won't be. Uh, yes and no. I mean, it's stable because you use the stable keyword, but you cannot use the stable keyword for any type of map. Like the hash map, right. the basic one doesn't work because it's not a stable type. And that's why Kyle imported, um, imported another map, another library. Yeah. Right. And the basic way that this works is that uh, at the current moment, no class instance, which can sort of hold its own internal state, is able to um, is able to be stable. So really, the only things that can be stable are um, structures where um, the format of them is using stable primitives. Uh, and then you basically are using methods out of the module. So like here we use map.get, um, like with the capital map from the module. Uh, that's going to be because we're using a function that then passes the entity. So all stable structures in Matoka will work like that. Whereas if you have like the hash map, which is a class-based structure, uh, you can have like the instance of the class as let my map equal hash map dot new or whatever dot create. And then you can put methods on the instance of the map uh, and refer to that. So anything that uses that format uh, is not going to be stable. 
uh, compatible. And you'll have to do some sort of serialization uh, before upgrading to and from stable memory in order to persist it. Okay. And that's all we need to do. So to revisit, uh, we can use this stable map, which will persist across updates. We can increment the count inside of the map. We can uh, check our own count, and we can get all of the counts as a JSON response. Let's move on to the front end. First, we'll set up NPM. Uh, with npm init dash y. I'm going to go ahead and install uh, a few of the agent.js packages. Uh, so that's the Definity agent, candid, the principal. I'll also go ahead and install Definity slash identity and Definity slash ii login button. We'll be using both of these in the front end. For the bundler, we're going to use Vite. So I'm going to create Vite.config.js. I'm just going to paste in an existing Vite config. Uh, which is going to install uh, Vite. It has uh, some pretty basics. It's going to point to the front end directory, specify where to go out to. It also sets up a proxy to the uh, localhost 4943 port, which is where DFX is going to be running, so it can talk to the canister. And it also has an environment plugin, which is going to allow it to um, handle the declarations that we're going to generate uh, for talking to our canister. Also go ahead and add in these dependencies here. And I'm going to also copy in some scripts from package.json uh, for dev, start, uh, mops, uh, sources and a build script. And we should also install mops, which is IC mops on NPM. Just so that all our tooling knows about it. One last configuration detail is I just copy and paste these little snippets here uh, by setting the pack tool uh, to use NPM sources. That's going to tell DFX to use mops when it's bundling our uh, package. So we can drop these in uh, the wrong spot. Drop these in here. And I'm just going to drop in the entire front end that I've already written and talk about how it works. All right, starting from the top, here we've got uh, an HTML website. You can see there is a JavaScript index, some CSS. Uh, dist we can delete until that's generated later. And here in the index.html, we've got a form with an input uh, ID secret. This is where you'll be able to type in um, some secret phrase that is going to represent um, an identity. Uh, it, we'll get into how that logic works, but this is just where you can type that in. An output div to show that. Um, a button that you can click to increment 
your counter disabled by default. We'll need to enable that once we have an identity. Um, a div to show your counts. And then a table, which is going to be where we display all of the counts. So jumping into the index, um, pretty straightforward. You'll see that we haven't um, generated our declarations yet. I uh, will get to that in just a second here. But we basically just have a main function. It's going to set up listeners, render the login button, uh, display all of the information for the table, and then pull for information. We bind the main to the DOM content loaded event listener. And then we've just got some extra logic here about how to display the information. Um, the core logic here is going to be around using an identity, creating an actor, which is going to be how the front end talks to the um, internet computer, and calling methods on that. So here, for example, get count is going to call the actor.myCount method that we defined right here in the canister. So uh, really quick, I'll go ahead and deploy uh, this canister. And uh, this actually failed because we need to first run uh, the dfx generate command so that we have our declarations. Now we can try that again. Well, that's running. We can take a look over here. This is what the dfx generate looks like. So it's got our Definity agent. It's going to export a canister ID, which is going to uh, be based on these environment variables. Uh, and then we've got these two other exports, a create actor method and backend, which will create a default um, actor to use. And we're going to use both of those over in our front end. So here we've got our backend as default backend actor which you can see we're using down here in the render table. Um, so this one doesn't need any authentication. We can fetch the counts uh, using the default anonymous identity um, because there is no authentication or access control on uh, that query method, right? It was for the other two methods of increment as well as get count my count uh, that we do have access controls on. And for the two of those, we're going to jump over to the um, get actor and seed to identity methods. So get actor is going to use the create actor from our declarations. And it's going to pass in an identity. And the way that we're going to get that identity is one of two ways. Uh, we can use the text input here by passing in a string seed, which we're going to then turn into a, an, a uint, array, uint 8 array uh, using text encoder. And then we're going to use that to generate an ED25519 key identity. Um, so this is going to be a reproducible identity using the secret. Uh, you'll always be able to resolve it using the same input. And then we also have a login button, which is going to do the same. And now we can come back. Go to our expected port. And here we can see our UI. So as we mentioned before, uh, you can see our secret input a login with internet identity button, our increment, click counter, and then the table is unpopulated because it hasn't been used yet. I'll go ahead and 
type in some information here. Uh, the secret four keys that I typed uh, are able to resolve this principle after it goes through our encoding process. And if I click increment, we have just made a call to a local canister, uh, the canister that we wrote. It has gone through and stored a principle, uh, our R caller as the principle, and then a count can give it a few more clicks. And as those call back and complete, we get those back here in the front end. If we go to a different principle, we have a different count, we can increment again. And we can also go ahead and jump over to an internet identity. Now we've just uh, skipped a couple steps, but uh, this login button is going to do a lot of the abstraction for us. You can see that in the setup logic repair login button, we're using a custom element here. And we have information that is going to allow us to configure that after it is set up, uh, passing in the identity provider um, based on the uh, local canister that we use here. So this logic is a really nice snippet to drop in uh, because it gives us this nice button. It'll also work when you deploy to mainnet. Uh, really quick, I'll go ahead and create an anchor here using the latest build. And now we're back in. We've got our new internet identity, identity, and it works just the same as the ED25519. So to review the way that this works, we have different identities that are available in the front end. Uh, you can resolve them in a number of different ways using secrets or using an authentication provider like Internet Identity. And by dropping these in, they allow us to sign messages that make updates on the Internet computer using the Definity agent package. And that is going to allow us to then make authenticated calls that only a specific principal has access to. And in Motoko, uh, we're able to gate this by using a shared caller as the identifier and then storing assets according to that. That is the gist of this presentation. The code will be up on GitHub. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A session uh, that'll come with the Motoko Bootcamp uh, coming right up next. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Okay. So, looks like we we have some people overwhelmed by the the JavaScript code that was on the on the presentation. We have a few questions as well. Yeah, and so for sure, like it's um, it goes pretty fast. Um, like, I, I think that the vanilla is a good place to start, just because there's a dozen JavaScript frameworks, um, all of which do deserve, I think, some attention. Um, but you know, this is a single example. Um, and yeah, basically what you've got going on in this code base is I did some rendering and some, you know, pointers to like document query selector and stuff like that um, for event handlers and all of that. Um, but all of the like core identity stuff is separated into its own file, the identity.js. And so that gives you basically what you've got for if you want to use the web component of the II login button, um, that's meant to be a more simplified way of handling internet identity integration. But there is another package, which is um, at definity slash auth client, um, which gives you more direct control. And like, that's what the web component is abstracting. 
Um, so I've got another example on my GitHub of an off client demo that shows how to do that. Again, I'm doing it in um, vanilla JavaScript just because I'm trying not to be super opinionated. Uh, but the IC avatar uh, code base uh, I did do in React. So that's an example if you're looking for a React off client integration example, uh, you can find that there. Um, and we've got some spelt examples in the Definity slash examples repo. Um, does requesting get count every time generate an actor uh, is a question that we've got, um, which I will answer. Um, so yes, in this code base, it does. Um, it's not necessarily an incredible pattern for a lot of applications. Um, but since like I'm having you just like, you know, type random stuff into uh, an input, and I'm also not doing a uh, a controlled state bound system like you would in Svelte or JavaScript, um, it, it like it would be more efficient to like only create the actor uh, each individual time. But for simplicity's purposes, and since the identity is going to change a lot, um, I just decided to create one. And creating an actor is basically um, taking a JavaScript class and initializing it with provided um, arguments. Um, the class will live for as long as it is held in memory and there is a, an active pointer to it, after which JavaScript will clean it up. And so since the life cycle of these functions is very short, it's not going to be like a huge problem for you in JavaScript to generate an actor each time. And the like performance is, or like the time cost is almost negligible. So, um, but you know, in pure efficiency, if you were <laughs> calling this like, I don't know, thousands of times, eventually it would add up. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, it's not a big deal. Uh, for the React example, if you scroll up, um, I linked the IC avatar code base. So that's krpeacock slash IC avatar. Um, that's got some React examples of authentication. And I can also link off client demo. Yeah, the earrings were fun. I had these uh, custom made. Um, so I'm the only person who has a pair right now. Do we have any Are there any questions? questions? Yeah, like particularly about like, you know, what's happening in the JavaScript authentication, when to use a JavaScript agent, when not to use one. Uh, I'm just curious where people are uh, thinking about this in terms of their own applications right now. I just linked, uh, well, I linked this felt one, but uh, it's the repository with uh, a lot of examples. I've already sent it on a lot of places, but this is where you can see more uh, front-end integration. You have React, uh, Svelte, and I think that's that's it. <laughs> 404. Yeah, no worries. Uh, if you're 404, it's, uh, it's okay. Like, uh, it's... Um, it's also a part that we haven't seen a lot. It's more about connecting with the front end. Um, so this is actually like very important to build a complete application. But we have been focusing on the back end those past few days. Um, but there will be more like uh, resource on the on the front end. I think it's tomorrow. You also have like a complete chapter about that. And um, yeah, like 
the most important part is the backend for this bootcamp, but I think it's also important to show you like how you can connect that with um, an interface. Someone would like to go through the JavaScript functions for the AI button. So, uh, Internet Identity button, yeah. so if you don't mind. I can share my screen if you want, or you should be able to do it as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll give the, the share a shot here. Okay. Uh, all right, cool. Oh, yeah. And um, this is just a recommendation or a tip. Um, if you are using principles as your key uh, and, and just deciding, you know, doing this access control, it's often a really good tip to add in a check here to see if the caller is an anonymous principle and not allow that because anyone has access to the anonymous identity by default uh, in, in agents. Um, so if you want, like, it's generally a good practice to exclude the anonymous agent for making calls. Uh, but let's jump over here. So yeah, this is all rendering logic and the identity here. Um, under the prepare login button method, um, I am defining a custom element. This is pretty boilerplate for web components. Um, the login button is designed by default to point to mainnet. Um, if you are doing local development, um, it won't know what the internet identity um, canister ID is. Um, so if you're only like publishing something and you only ever need to talk to mainnet canisters, uh, then you can kind of skip this step. But if you are doing like both local and mainnet development and you have like a locally deployed internet identity, like we did really quickly with dfx.json using this snippet here. Um, then this step waits until the login button fires a ready event. Um, and after that, it will configure it with some information about the identity provider. That way, when we try to log in uh, by clicking the button, um, it will do its whole login workflow and it'll send you to um, this address as opposed to the, the mainnet one. And then the only other detail here is you can listen for a login event so that you know what to do with it. And once it's logged in, you can check uh, the identity property, which will be uh, an identity that you can use. And here I'm setting window.identity equals identity. If you're using a framework, there will be some sort of like set state or um, you know this, this other kind of like, you've got some value that you want to control uh, and you'll use that process um, instead of setting the window object. But since I'm trying to keep it very basic and abstract, uh, that's how I'm managing my global state is I'm just setting it on the window. I have also two persons raising the end, so I'm going to uh, Mud Mudrizar, you can uh, talk. You should be able now if you have a question. And Also, money. You can. You should be able to speak now. I think they raised their hand like a few a few minutes ago, so maybe they don't have a question anymore. Um, I, uh, no, I don't have any question. I was like trying to hit the chat button, but you can you can guys keep going. Thank you. Thanks.
Uh, and is that true for for both of the hands raised? Yeah, I, I think so. So yeah, if we don't have any more questions, we can wrap it up here. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I'm going to have a mentorship session in two hours, so you can join, especially if you're stuck with day two. I will try to give some some hints and help you. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know if you're planning to go to the two years anniversary party in the in the office, but um, yeah, have a nice uh, have a nice afternoon. And thank you for coming. Absolutely. Uh, good luck with all of your uh, tasks, everyone, and the rest of the boot camp. Uh, really looking forward to seeing what people come up with. Yeah. Thank you.